Okay, here's the next phase. This was a big step for me for a lot of reasons. I was used to just using two-dimensional drawings before, and now this next step is going to require me to learn two different languages, you could say. I need to, I need to learn three-dimensional drawing because that's what this machine here eats. It can't take 2D drawings. You need a, a full-scale three-dimensional drawing. So I had to take that on and learn that. And when I did that, um, I chose Rhinoceros for my drawing program. I had some issues with the AutoCAD that I had. Um, it was not user-friendly to me. Uh, I, I started out on Inventor uh, when it first came out and I didn't like it. I was used to AutoCAD LT and the Inventor just threw me for a loop and I it came bundled with a mechanical AutoCAD drafting program that had a three, 3D application on it, but I found that was a little awkward as well. So a friend told me about Rhinoceros. It was a lot less money and I felt it did amazing things and um, it was more user friendly to me, to what I was used to. So that's what I had started to um, learn on Rhinoceros, a 3D program. Then when you get to having to feed this machine, you have to have a CAM program that generates your tool pass. That was the next language that you had to learn. And it all, of course, comes with a nice price tag. But I felt my thumbs <laughs> and my fingers were worth that. And uh, I wasn't real comfortable in that machine, especially after I cut my thumb. So that being said, I dove into the world of CNC machining. So I looked around at different machines and I felt this cam, cam master was a good entry level for me. It was just probably heavy enough, but not too heavy and not too expensive. And it seemed pretty user friendly and uh, good forums with the people that already had them. So that's what I went with. But when I got the machine, I knew that I would be doing more than just flat milling on the table. I needed to have something that I could rotate. So they had a package that they sold. Uh, it was a fourth axis on the side. I didn't have the money to get it at the time I bought this machine. And I wasn't sure I was 100% with the one that they offered from the factory. So what I did was I got the gantry with the extension on the end all ready to go when I felt I was able to put the fourth axis on. That didn't happen for quite a while. Uh, it just was too much to bite off at the time. And I'm going to introduce someone else right now. And his name is Joe. <laughs> and he's been a, a tremendous help to me. And he really does a good job. He's learned this trade. He understands the machine. He understands the drawing process. And he's been amazing with that. So I'm very thankful for him. And, I, and he's my youngest son and I hope that he chooses to carry this whole thing on. It seems like he wants to, we will see. So in the future, you may be hearing Joe's voice on the other end of the phone or answering the email. So Joe, come on over here. So here he is, <laughs> this big guy. <laughs> He's doing great here and I love it. So, um, what I want him to do right now is to go over and pick up this, that one um, first fourth axis manual. <laughs> you can bring it over here. I think I can deal with it over here. Okay, before I was able to purchase the fourth axis, um, I used two of these. And I would screw one down here and one down here, depending on my block. And what I did was I, I uh, milled different degree marks 
in this end. Right now, it's, it's, it's been used and abused. I used it for probably, I don't know, two years or something like that. And um, what I would do is I would screw my handrail block on here, and then I would plug this thing in here and put it to the degree that I wanted to rotate it at. And then I would screw it in here and secure it so it would be locked in. And I would do that on both ends. I have an identical one that I used to put on the other end. Then I was able to rotate it to whatever degree I wanted that I felt would mill the handrail and cover the twisted parts as well as I could. It was usually right at zero when I started, but not always. And I would mill the top surface. And when I say mill, we're not talking about a five axis machine that has a dedicated profile cuddle, cutter that just mills the profile on the side or on the top. We're talking about, get one of those half inch ball nose cutters there. This is the guy that does almost all my work here. It's a half inch ball nose. Thanks, Joe. And that's where we start out. And if the handrail doesn't have any little beads or, or fillets that that can't reach into, I can make the whole handrail with that one cutter. Now that has a great advantage in, in many ways. If I, if I have to have a bead cut into something like the 6010 rail, you know it has that little bead on the bottom on the side. I have to put this real small cutter in. It's only a sixteenth at the end and it's tapered. And that allows me to get into the little creases where the half inch radius ball nose can't reach. So after I mill the top surface on this and it'll put the twist in the top of it, then I would from the drawing know what rotation I need to go to to get the side or 180 to get the bottom. So this is like a manual fourth axis. It worked. So it wasn't convenient, but it worked. So then I started to think, well, it's time to put the fourth axis on. So I did some searching on the internet and I found this rotation head here. It didn't have this motor on, it had a hand crank on it. It was meant to be mounted either flat or standing, maybe on a milling machine, and to be able to index. It has all the degrees on the side with a mark on the side so you can tell how far it's rotating. Um, but I didn't know a few things about it. So I ended up designing this thing and getting it set up. I put a motor on, I took the crank off, put a motor on, and it already had um, the equipment in my electronics uh, cabinet here that I ordered from the start to be able to plug this in. I was prepared for it. So this worked. It worked pretty good for a number of years. There was a couple things that I didn't like about it. First thing was this motor has a 90 to one ratio. It means this thing has to spin around 90 times for it to go around once. And I didn't know it at the time, but that was gonna be a hindrance to me. And this is why. I had seen videos and wanted to be able to, be able to mill a surface and have it rotate while it was milling it so that the cutter was always perpendicular to the surface it was milling. I thought I'd be able to do it with this one. I couldn't, mostly because of that ratio. All the other axes were spinning at a set rate, uh, rate, and when it came to rotating this with the motor, it was too slow, and it, it would end up slowing the whole operation down and burning spots on the wood. So that was no good. The other thing I didn't like was the fact that this gantry is unsupported out here on the end. And so what would happen if you would beef up the speed of cutting, you would end up getting deflection here and backlash. 
and it ended up leaving nice little divots all around because the machine is always trying to compensate for anything it doesn't think is in a line. So it would try and overcompensate and you'd get a lot of backlash and bouncing. So at that point, I thought, well, I'm going to see if I mount something to the table, whether it would eliminate two things. First of all, I can get one that has the correct uh, ratio of turning, and I can eliminate that overhang on the gantry. So I didn't want to stretch myself out financially, so I found one, which is right here in front of you here, that I was able to mount right to the table. And this one has a 10 to 1 ratio, which works really well. And we're also in the gantry area that's fully supported. So once I got that going, um, I felt that it was a great improvement. And this one will do what I just told you that I was hoping this one would do. This one will turn. And as the cutter's going back and forth, it turns and keeps it perpendicular to the surface. And it works out much better when you go around the corners that you don't have funny overlaps that I was getting with this. So that's the process that, and that's where we're at. I'm looking into possibly uh, having a dedicated machine built that's very similar to this that would, uh, I wouldn't have to mount it on a tabletop. So that might be the next phase. Okay. I think we wrapped everything up here. I just want to let you know if you want more information or if you'd like to see more of what we do in the shop, you can go to my website, customhandrails.com, or my Instagram page, I think is customhandrails49, and check out some of the other things that, uh, that I've done. And if you really want to dig into this a little bit more, if you go on my, in, uh, my website on the blog tab, and scroll all the way down to the bottom. It shows a great process of um, applying paper patterns onto a real tight radius handrail and uh, what that looks like in the process. So thank you for watching.